Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Taylor and I'm a lecturer in civil engineering. So this is Railway Engineering Unit 4, Formation Engineering. In this unit we're going to look at formation engineering, which will include examining the ballast used, the earthworks, the subgrade, the formation and the drainage systems. So in this unit, I aim to describe the terms used in formation design. I'll introduce the measurement of track modulus, discuss the physical properties of ballast and the methods of maintenance, introduce the main requirements for all earthworks design, provide examples of remedial measures to prevent slope failure, and provide case studies on typical failure modes and their impacts. So by the end of this unit, you should be able to describe the key functions of the formation components, calculate track modulus for a given section of track, identify the causes of ballast failure, recommend appropriate measures for the maintenance of a section of ballasted track, describe the geotechnical mechanisms behind slope failure, and recommend remedial measures for a variety of earthworks applications. Finally, you should be able to recognise the importance of monitoring earthworks beyond the railway boundary. So let's now just remind ourselves of some of the key definitions. So the track bed is the ballast and sub-ballast layers, including any geotextile membranes on which the sleepers lay. The formation or subgrade is the prepared soil stratum on which the track bed is constructed. The formation normally excludes the track bed itself, and be cautious, these terms are often mixed up. This figure just shows a typical railway cross section. You can see the sleepers, the ballast, the subgrade, the positions of drains, the positions of cable troughs in the, in the recess, and also the position of ditches and fences associated with slopes and embankments. So let's now have a look at the track bed in more detail. The key functions of the track bed are to support the track, to allow water to drain from underneath the sleepers, and to also distribute the load to the subgrade. It's important that the position of the rail does not change with time. It must also return to its original position after the passage of a train. It must move elastically under vehicle loading within tolerable limits. So, what is track stiffness? Typically, the track system, the rails, are supported by a number of elements in series, so the rail pads, the sleepers, the ballast, the sub-ballast, and the subgrade or formation. These elements all deform elastically. That is, the deflection isn't permanent, so it recovers back to its original position. This happens when they're loaded and unloaded during the passage of a train. So the term track stiffness may be taken to mean the point load required to produce a unit deflection of the rail at the location where the load is applied. It has units of force divided by deflection, for example, kilonewtons per millimetre. It is what the train sees, or feels if you like, and its value depends on the effective stiffness of all the individual elements of the track system combined, including the flexural rigidity or the bending stiffness of the rails. It may therefore be considered a composite or global stiffness. There's a guide to track stiffness published uh, in August 2016, and I've shared that in the virtual learning environment. So the guide to track stiffness was produced by the Cross Industry Track Stiffness Working Group. This group comprised of network rail engineers, practicing permanent way engineers and academic researchers. The effective or combined stiffness of the system supporting the rails may be characterized by means of a modulus. And this is defined as the stiffness of the equivalent springs supporting the rails in terms of the load per unit length needed to produce a unit displacement at the point of measurement. This type of modulus has units of force per unit length divided by displacement, for example, meganewtons per metre squared. 
the modulus at the level of the rails can be further divided into the contributions from the different components, such as the track bed and the rail pads. A recent innovation has been the use of undersleeper pads, and we can see a couple of photographs of these below. They modify the support stiffness below the sleeper. Many analyses model the track as a beam, the rails, on an elastic foundation, the support, and this is generally abbreviated to BOEF. It's therefore convenient to separate the flexural rigidity of the rails, which for a standard rail type is well defined, from the direct stiffness of the support system, i.e. the rail pads, the ballast, the sub-ballast and the subgrade, which can vary widely. This concept is illustrated below, which also shows a series of moving loads. The rail support stiffness may be separated into that above the sleepers, principally arising from the rail pads, which is relatively easy to control, and that below the sleepers arising from the ballast, sub-ballast and subgrade, together termed the track bed. So, more related to the stiffness of the ballast, the stresses in the rails, the rail seat reaction, the stresses in the sleeper, and the quality of the stiffness is given by the name track modulus. And the track modulus is effectively an index of, for the stiffness of the track bed. So the track modulus is the uniformly distributed line load required to produce unit deflection of the support. So in summary, the track modulus is dependent on the gauge, the rail type or the stiffness of the rails, the sleeper type, the frequency or the spacing of the sleepers, the ballast type, the depth of ballast, and the subgrade. The units are typically newtons per metre squared, but it's often specified as mega newtons per metre squared, as it's usually a very large value. A lower support stiffness results in a wider deflection bowl, spreading the load and reducing the contact stresses between the sleepers and the ballast and hence stresses throughout the substructure. The track stiffness needs to be reasonable, but not excessively stiff. A stiffer support reduces rail bending and tends to minimise the general variability of the track stiffness along the length of the track. However, some give or flexibility in the support is needed to spread loads. This is because the vertical contact between the wheel and the rail is itself extremely stiff. In general terms, the track stiffness can be too high, it can be too low, or it can be too variable. However, there is a range in between too high and too low within which track performance has been found to be acceptable for existing track. Various researchers in North America and Europe have assumed that the rail supporting base, consisting of pads, ties, ballast and subgrade, may be represented by layers of springs, each with a different stiffness, arranged in series, as shown schematically on the right. There are various methods of measuring the track stiffness. In Wang et al, in a paper published in the Journal of Modern Transport, Volume 24, 2016, review the various techniques and processes and equipment that can be used to measure track stiffness. You'll find this in the virtual learning environment in the additional reading. The track bed should be free draining to at least 25 millimetres below the underside of the sleeper, ideally about 200 millimetres. The track bed also should be deep enough to ensure loading on the top surface of the subgrade is uniform. Pyramids of support should touch or overlap. When drainage provision fails, it can cause serious problems to the network. Here we can see some flooding near Greenock in Scotland. And this picture was taken by Network Rail. It not only causes problems with the subgrade, but it also causes problems with signalling through the conductivity of the water affecting the track circuit. It's the wettest summer for a century, and Yorkshire is one of the worst affected areas. Due to today's wet weather, 
please take extra care whilst on the station. For the railway staff, weather like this is far more challenging than the most difficult of passengers. And it's Friday, the busiest day of the week. Have we got another storm coming? It's gone dark. It's like night time suddenly, isn't it? Are we going to float away from Leeds Station? <laughs> Weather. Dozens of rapid response teams are deployed to keep the trains moving. Torrential downpour in certain areas, isn't it? The drain just can't take the volume of water. Cut all the caution in for definite here. The biggest lightning's it axle counters. It's like I'm piss wet through out here, just checking all flooding because all top of the roadway is flooded as well. First stop is on the outskirts of Leeds. Here, a road next to the train line has flooded because the council's drain is blocked. Because they don't maintain it on a regular basis, fills up, water then flows through the fence line, straight onto the railway, and people keep asking why you're slowing my train down again. It's because your local council couldn't bother to come and clean the drain out once or twice a year. If nothing interfered with railway, trains would run on time. But because it's literally external things, or keep naffing the railway, like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it's flooded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's always a story. No idea. No idea. Not at this moment in time. But they have got people out working yeah, on it. Yeah, no, yet. There's not, in all honesty, there's not a great deal we can do because it's the sheer volume of water was coming down. A month's worth of rain has fallen in just one day and flooding sites are popping up all over Kevin Steff's patch as water pours off the neighbouring land onto the tracks. This is a classic. It used to be wasteland. They build a brand new housing estate or they build umpteen new factories. They haven't piped it into anything. They've just literally stuck it onto embankment and sort of gone, there you go, it's yours now. You deal with it. There's definitely no trains going at this moment in time because it's flooded. Well, if I wait for the next one, will it definitely come? No. There's no let up in the rain, and by three o'clock, flooding has crippled the network. All trains on this main line from Leeds to London have now been stopped. Controlled havoc would be a good description. Uh, it's a weather event, it's something that's quite unprecedented for the time of year. It looks like every route we've got, we've got has got major incidents on it. And with rush hour fast approaching, the pressure is on to get the trains moving. Hello, mate. Is this urgent or can it wait? There's a massive tree stump that's wedged in uh, right. at side. And then we're off to Carverley. And it may need the sandbags rebuilding back up. I hope he's not looking for this fleece. I've just pinched his. It's the only dry one we've got left. <laughs> every, every minute counts, and it's, it's things that we have no control over. Kev and Stev have been dispatched to the site where trains are stranded. The line is closed because once flood water rises above the rail, there's a very real risk of derailment. Basically, when the, the rail is covered, it's not very right practical to start running trains on something you can't actually see. Because you don't know what's floating in it. We don't know what sort of track do we? It's washed in which yeah. track. The drainage system is now overwhelmed, so there's nowhere to pump the water to. The only thing they can do is try to channel the water away from the rails. Once we get it so it can actually drop down below rail head, we then, to believe it or not, start running at five mile an hour, at least get passengers up and running again. You know what I mean? That's been delayed as well, yeah. Rush hour. Routes are now blocked in almost every direction, and staff on the front line are struggling to give any options to the passengers. Do you know that train to Glasgow has been delayed? Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, what are the chances of it getting here? Yeah? Um, I don't know. That, that's being completely honest, yeah. because it's, it's, you're being stuck behind a flood. I don't, I don't know what to say. Do you know if the next one will be running or...? I, I don't. I, I would doubt it at the moment. 
the only, out. It's the only way. Sorry? It's the only, that's the only train that goes to Skithernska where we need to be. You said Sheffield. And I just well, want to know well, if it's going to be running. I was, I was running. telling you about the Sheffield, the Sheffield train. train. Not, is... not a Thernsco train. I know you're probably having a really bad day and all that, but well, no, no, you're supposed no. to be calming me down, not me calming you down, mate. <laughs> Going slowly. Kev and Stev have at last managed to drop the water levels enough to open the line. The underpants are really wet now. But getting trains moving is a slow process. They're only allowed to run at five miles per hour causing them to stack up as they await their turn to go through the flooded area. You delayed my train, you. I'm sat on a train, you're still outside the train. It must be your fault why I am not getting between point A and point B. It's always our fault. Flooding, so why didn't you deal with it? Oh, my life. Um... Ah. Uh, right, let me just do some maths first. For every minute a train is delayed by flooding, trespasses or any technical problems, it's network rail that foots the bill. It's been absolutely phenomenal. We've, we've accrued in just one day alone, and this is just looking at lightning strikes, which account for 2,600 minutes, 16,500 minutes worth of delay caused by flooding across the route. In a day, that's probably two months' worth of budget in terms of minutes. Which is huge. Right then, because that air runs. Let's okay. jump from a bus first. <laughs> if you've got a car packed in the station, I'll get you to the station. You don't need to be rude to me, I'm asking you. Are we getting all the taxis or are we getting individual taxis? It's a question. Will it be taxis? Yeah, just hang on here. The way, way, the East Coast member of the staff will come and sort you out very shortly. Network Rail has to pay up to £200 for every minute of delay to the train companies, some of which is passed on to the passengers, claiming ticket refunds or taxis home. He's on his own. We just have to be patient. I appreciate it's not been a great night for you, but he is doing his best, all right? Yes, he will do, yes. Anybody else wanting a claim form? Might be complete form for the lack of complete form in a minute. <laughs> We're running out very drastically, yeah. Chuffing hell. From my opinion, it would be so much better if this was all excludable and we didn't pay anything. And somebody said, that's something you can't do anything about, therefore we'll write it off as a day. Uh, but the regimes don't work like that. There you go, love. That's your claims form for you, OK? You on go, Jerry's love. route, compensation paid out for flooding on this one day is a million pounds. Bingley and Keithley! People wonder why trains are expensive. It's completely nonsense. So now we're going to have a look at the ballast. So the general characteristics required for ballast, that it must be economical, it must be packable, therefore granular, it must resist crushing, it must resist breaking, it must provide frictional and interlocking properties, and it also must be resistant to longitudinal and lateral movement. And this leads to a rock aggregate being chosen as an optimum solution. The image shown at the top here is the Glensanda Coastal Super Quarry in Lismore up on the west coast of Scotland. To obtain this rock aggregate, we must quarry. And this is an aerial view of the Glensanda Super Quarry. It's owned by Aggregate Industries and is the largest granite quarry in Europe. Exporting to markets all across Northern Europe, it has an annual production capacity in excess of 9 million tonnes and a massive 760 million tonne reserve of granite. So we have to use crushed rock rather than smooth round gravel. This generates interlocking between the particles. They must be the appropriate size as well, small enough so that sufficient particles between the sleepers can transfer the loads and large enough such that water can be drained and not blocked by sediment. They must be resistant to break down by water and in practice the ballast is a mixture of particle sizes to provide a balance between porosity and strength. And the Glensanda granite is an ideal material. 
The ballast particles can fail in a number of different ways. They can fail by crushing, so if they're overloaded, or mechanical maintenance through machine and manual tamping. Abrasion can occur either through tamping or dynamic track movement under traffic, or attrition, and this can be exacerbated by the presence of water. A tamping machine or ballast tamper is a machine used to pack the ballast underneath the sleepers, and this ensures that the tracks are more durable and of the correct stiffness. Prior to the introduction of mechanical tampers, this was done manually with the help of beaters. You can also get handheld tools which rely upon two stroke engines and an isolated uh, connection to a poker which can then be pressed down into the ballast and help compact ballast underneath the sleepers. The ballast system degrades due to the creation of fines or the ingress of fines from above, maybe spillage from trains or wind blown material, or ingress of vegetation or ingress of material from the formation. Ballast particles can degrade by rounding of the corners or breakage due to crushing or impact loading. All stones suffer from these problems, some are worse than others. Some stones are affected badly when wet, a syndrome known as wet attrition, and this type of stone is not desirable for ballast. So the wet attrition value can be used to test for identifying suitable types of stone. The test involves the given weight of ballast, a given weight of water, combined in a cylindrical drum, sealed and rotated 10,000 times in a skew axis, and the percentage of balance wore down to a size less than 2.4 millimetres is the WAV value. Granites tend to have a good WAV value, limestones tend to be very poor. The WAV test is similar in terms of the conditions for a wet spot of track. So in terms of ballast supplies, I've already talked about the Glen Sander Coastal Super Quarry. And here's another photograph of the quarry taken by my colleague Richard Llewellyn. The ballast is often taken from these quarries. It can be transported by sea, then eventually by rail, but that depends on the location. And the ballast is often supplied from virtual quarries, which are really just quarries that have been set up close to a suitable location for delivery to sites at various locations. So if the voids between the ballast become blocked, this affects the ability of the ballast to drain water. The solution is to lift, clean and reinstate the ballast using a mechanised process. The following video shows one of these machines in action.
So now we're going to have a look at some examples of ballast and subgrade failure. So pumping failure is track movement associated with the presence of a liquid slurry at or above the sleeper soffit level. And this makes the sleeper unstable. The slurry lubricates the ballast and enables movement. There are two key types, dirty ballast failure, or DBF, and erosion pumping failure, or EPF. The results of both forms is a sudden loss in rail level. Dirty ballast failure is formed from attrition products. For example, frequently tamped ballast, windblown deposits, brake dust, concrete sleeper erosion, or dirt from vehicles, and it's remedied by cleaning the ballast. So an erosion pumping failure, the slurry is derived from cohesive subgrade. The contraction and dilation of voids and ballast draws up the slurry, and the slurry rises from the cohesive soils to the underside of the sleeper. The remedy is a sand blanket or geotextile to filter slurry and prevent the particles from rising. So pump inferior can cause derailments. And here we can see two photographs from the Transportation Safety Board of Canada, where we can see a defective track, which has eventually led to a loss of gauge and a derailment. Another failure mechanism is bearing capacity failure. This is a continuous loss of rail level and occurs days after the onset of wet weather. It affects length of rail from around 3 to 10 sleepers and it usually affects the low rail. Heave of soil is generally experienced adjacent to the track and removal of soil increases the loss. So a remedy for bearing capacity failure is excavation which increases subgrade depth to lower pressure intensity on the soil surface. It changes the track modulus by new ballast to redistribute the pressure. It reduces the access of water to the subgrade and also improves drainage of the water by trimming the subgrade. So what can we do to extend the ballast life? Geogrids can maintain track geometry for longer, up to three times longer. They can reduce the rate of ballast settlement. They can reduce traffic induced ballast degradation. And they can also extend the maintenance cycle. And here we can see a tensor product being installed.
So now we're going to look at earthworks. And this is generally the subject of civil engineering associated with geotechnical engineering. In this case, we're going to look at earthworks specifically associated with formation engineering for railways. So with any civil engineering project, it's critical to undertake preliminary investigation of the soils that we're going to be using. Detailed geotechnical investigations are required to determine the safe angle at which cutting slopes can be excavated and the correct treatment for forming excavated material into an embankment. So before we do anything, we're going to undertake a desktop study and the material that we could gather may include geological maps, topographical maps, mining records, aerial photographs, possibly from drones, or maybe some Earth satellite imagery. So some localised investigation may be required. We could do that by either maybe shear vein testing, piezometers, inclinometer tubes, seismometers, resistivity meters, gravimeters. There could also be some off-site testing of soils. The most important factor is the shear strength of the soil. So the shear strength can be considered as internal friction. This could be the interlocking of the particles. It depends on pressure across the sheared surface. And this is the main strength of sand and gravel. Cohesion, where the resistance from forces holding particles as a solid mass. It varies with rate and extent of strain and drainage. And is independent of intergranular pressure. And this is the main reason for failure in clay soils. So if a soil is cohesive, the forces around any cylindrical section in earthwork must be in equilibrium. The forces produced by mass of material contained by a surface is equal to the resistance by shear strength of the soil. For normally consolidated soils, if a slope is stable after cutting is formed with good drainage, it should stay so indefinitely. Control of water is very important in terms of designing earthworks. Drainage measures should prevent water from reaching the slope, remove any water that does reach the slope, efficiently intercept the water. There must be features such as impermeable membranes to prevent water re-entering the soil. And it must be aligned with the geotextile layer to prevent erosion and fouling. They must also be designed for the ease of maintenance. So you have to remember that many of the railway earthworks were constructed when knowledge of soil mechanics was limited. Remember that we're dealing with a lot of Victorian engineering structures. That means that a great amount of the effort is concentrated on remedial works for failures. So instability can be caused by shear strains, e.g. slips or bearing capacity failures, ancient slip surfaces, a volume change, e.g. shrinkage or swelling, or erosion, either internal or external. Slips result in steepness increases at the top of a slope and additional material at the bottom. They're caused by rotation of the material. As the material rotates, the moment is reduced as G moves closer to the vertical through the origin. The surface by which the material moves is known as a slip surface. These images show the landslides that occurred at the Bonessen Canal Railway in 2020. You can see here the additional material at the bottom of the slope. So the concern is not so much the additional material at the bottom of the slope, but what happens if the rest of the slope slips and it then obstructs the track. So what's got to happen now is some remedial works to repair this damage and ensure it doesn't happen again during heavy storms. So what could cause these slips? There could be local geology issues where cuttings pass through strata of different material. There could be surface weathering caused by inclement weather. There could be changes in poor water pressure over time in over consolidated clays. There could be deep cracks forming in particular in dry weather. There could be unlined drainage ditches effectively starting a crack. There could be excavation work at the foot of a slope. Or ballast cleaning may allow water ingress. 
in the case of the slips at Bowness, it was a period of severe weather, or inclement weather, with heavy rainfall. This was probably one of the most spectacular accidents involving a TGV, and set a record for the world's fastest derailment. It occurred before the TGV Hot Picard station was built, near the southern end of where the platforms are located today. After a period of heavy rain, a large sinkhole opened up under track 2 southbound. Two trains had already passed the spot and detected no anomaly as late as 10 minutes before the accident. At 0706 hours, TGV 7150 was bearing down at 294 km per hour, approximately 183 miles per hour. On a muddy hole 7 by 5 metres and 1.5 metres deep, bridged by a section of unsupported track. The engineer felt a slight bump and made a service brake application. The last four trailers and rear power unit derailed and the train came to a rocky stop over a distance of 2.3 kilometres, about 1.4 miles, somewhat less than it takes for a conventional emergency stop. It was fortunate that the train did not jackknife or leave the track bed. This is credited in part to the stiffness that the articulated design lends to the train. Only one passenger was injured and another treated for shock. The sinkhole was traced to an unstable terrain beneath the track bed, possibly caused by galleries and trenches from World War I. How closely a disaster was averted is a matter of debate. However, the track bed has since been carefully inspected to prevent similar occurrences in the future. So alluvial soils with a high water content can subside due to water being squeezed out, but this will stabilise with time. Felling of trees can result in increased water content in clay soils. Surface erosion is an issue immediately after construction and can be assisted with geotextile membranes. Once plants establish, surface erosion should not be a problem. So let's now have a look at remedial works that can be undertaken. So there's a number of methods we can use to treat a slip. We could reduce the forces by reprofiling, or we could increase the soil strength, we could control water, or we could provide some mechanical support. One remediation technique is the use of geocells. These can be used to stabilise slope by confining fill to small cells. They can reduce the potential for surface erosion. The cell walls are made from permeable geotextiles. This allows drainage from cell to cell down the slope. Another remedial technique is soil nailing or grouting. The installation of grouted soil nails into slopes. This can provide mechanical resistance to slip planes. It requires specialist installation and may be finished off with some rock netting or fencing at the bottom, including sensors to detect a slip or falling debris. Or you could simply just reprofile the embankment. Here you can see reprofiling works taking place at the Borders Railway at Tyne Head. Another remedial technique is installation of gabions. Here you can see an excavator preparing an excavation for the installation of gabion cages and stones. Here you can see the use of gabions on the Airdrie to Bathgate Railway. So on a Sunday evening in June 2013, after heavy rain, a retaining wall at Harris Park Station collapsed. The wall was only 30 years old. The investigation suggested poor design, construction and maintenance issues. Sydney train bosses have revealed the spectacular wall collapse at Harris Park Station in June was preventable with missed opportunities to fix the problem going back at least four years. State politics reporter Kevin Wilde joins us now live from the station. Kevin, good evening to you. Uh, what's being done to stop this happening again? 
Well, Wendy, it's quite simple. They're going to get a senior engineer to double-check all the maintenance reports to make sure that all of these retaining walls, if repairs need to be done, that someone actually does them in the future. Now, they released this amazing video caught on one of the cameras here on the station showing the wall collapsing. Now, the main reason is poor design, but also poor maintenance, that they knew as far back as 2009 that there were problems. One inspection report even indicated there was leaning and bulging in the wall, but simply no one bothered to do anything about it. There is already a new program of checking. There's also a new program of processes to, to ensure that those checks are double checked again. The other thing, Sydney Trains is making sure that all these retaining walls across the network of about the same age and same design, about 30 years old, they haven't found any problems so far, which is good news. Now, there's a new management team. Let's hope that they are much more attentive and they get the maintenance culture right so that there's no more disasters. Wendy, this happened on a Saturday night. God knows what would have happened if it was a Monday morning. All right, Kevin, thank you. So let's now have a look at what can happen when mining damage occurs. So on the East Coast Main Line, just outside Wallyford, just to the east of Edinburgh, a major emergency groundworks had to be undertaken in an area riddled with old coal mine shafts and tunnels. Crown holes up to two metres in diameter appeared just next to the track, and a subsequent test borehole found a three metre void just seven metres below the track. A massive amount of remedial work was required and this meant that the track could not be repaired while trains were running at 125 miles per hour. Full closure of the line would have been very disruptive. It would have taken almost one year for the construction project to be completed. So the solution was to realign 1.6 kilometres of the affected track, keeping the old track live while constantly monitoring for movement and imposing a speed limit of 20 miles per hour. Here you can see an aerial photograph of the diversion. The blue arrow shows the original line and the red arrow shows the diversion. So for the Wallyford diversion, there was a detailed assessment of the ground conditions. This also coincided with a geotechnical risk analysis. It was cost effective to have a temporary diversion and then construct a permanent slab solution. The solution chosen was piled ground slab adjacent to the existing line. So sometimes the problem is not actually the railway itself. Sometimes the problems are caused by neighbours, in particular bad neighbours. Here you can see an image of the Hatfield coil in Wanslip. You can see an aerial photograph of the mine workings. You can also see the significant damage to the tree line and the railway track. 
So this landslip happened in 2013 near Doncaster. 1.4 million tonnes of spoil slipped onto the railway. It moved the tracks 5 metres vertically and 15 metres laterally. It required 1 million cubic metres of spoil to be removed. It required reconstruction of the track bed and relaying of track for over 500 metres. Another earthworks problem that can occur is rock falls. So the Crook and Rockfall occurred just outside Auburn in June 2010. The 1820 service from Glasgow Queen Street to Auburn struck a boulder and derailed. There were eight passengers on the train and some of them incurred minor injuries. The accident was a result of vegetation growth, loosening a boulder combined with surface erosion. An existing safety warning system was ineffective in preventing the accident. The serial photograph from the RAIB investigation shows how mountainous this area is in the banks of Loch Awe. You can see the 85 road and the railway line as it hugs the mountain. So there were a number of existing safety measures in operation in this section of line. The first one was a boundary fence at the top of the slope. Then there was a signal system installed in the 19th century to warn of falling rocks. There was also dense vegetation towards the bottom of the slope, which could provide further arrest to a potential fall. So the Pass of Brander stone signals are a series of railway signals situated in the Pass of Brander between Loch Awe and Tainault stations on the Oban branch of the West Highland Line in Scotland. They're part of a warning system that advises train drivers to exercise caution in the event of a rock fall. This image shows the position of the trajectory of the rock and its final location on the track. So you can see the consequences of this accident. The train struck the rock and derailed. One of the coaches has ended up down the side of the embankment. Clearly this presents a significant issue for rescuing passengers from the train. It also presents a very significant issue for actually recovering this train and getting it back onto the tracks and getting it moved away from this location safely. You can see from this photograph how this boulder managed to cause the derailment. Accident clearance operation was very complex and hazardous. This was a single track line with the open end being a terminus so it was very difficult to bring in a rail based crane. The train was hanging in a very difficult position on a steep embankment surrounded by trees. The adjacent A85 road was also built over an elevated causeway over the water in Loch Awe, so a structural assessment was required of that prior to ensuring that it was suitable for mounting a crane upon. This photograph shows the lifting operation, and as you can see, this is no mean feat. So the RAIB recommendations to Network Rail included improving the clearance of vegetation growing on earthworks so that hazards to the safety of the railway could be identified. Also improve the collection of slope data so that a full appreciation of the condition of slopes could be obtained and improve the process for the implementation of remedial works to prevent future earthworks failures. So, can unpreventable damage occur? Well, I don't think there's an awful lot we can do about earthquakes. Here's an example of some earthquake damage to railway in Turkey. So we can't stop the damage to the track, but what we can do is detect the earthquakes. And in the case of the Japanese Shinkansen, what happened in 2011 was they detected the 8.9 magnitude earthquake and they sent the automatic stop signal to all the Shinkansen which then applied the emergency brakes on 33 trains. So you'll notice throughout this lecture that I've used extracts from REIB reports. In this case, we're now going to look at a specific report associated with a derailment near Moy, just outside in Venetia on the 26th of November, 2005. At the time of recording this lecture, 
Unfortunately, there was another fatal derailment in Scotland at Carmont. At around 09.38 hours on Wednesday the 12th of August 2020, all six vehicles of a passenger train derailed after striking a landslip around 1.4 miles northeast of Carmont in Aberdeenshire. There were nine people on the train at the time of the accident, three train crew, the driver, conductor and second conductor travelling as a passenger on the train and six passengers. Tragically, the driver of the train and the train's conductor and one of the passengers suffered fatal injuries in the accident. The remaining passengers and members of the train crew were taken to hospital. At around 09.38 hours, the train struck a landslip, covering the down line and derailed. As the track curved to the right, the train continued in roughly a straight line for around 77 yards or 70 metres until it struck a section of bridge parapet which was destroyed. The site of the accident is approximately 6.4 kilometres southwest of Stonehaven and 32 kilometres north of Montrose on a double track main line which runs between Dundee and Aberdeen. The train, which was operated by Abelio, trading as ScotRail, was a high speed train set with a leading power car, four Mark III passenger coaches and a rear power car. In the area where the derailment occurred, on the left hand side of the railway, in the direction of travel of the train, a slope rises steeply to a field, which then slopes gently upwards and away from the railway. A drain runs northwards along the lower edge of the field until it reaches an access chamber about 50 metres south of the landslip area. From where it runs diagonally down a steep slope, passing through two or more access chambers until it reaches an outfall structure at the track level ditch, which takes water northwards towards the Carron water. The drain running diagonally consists of a 450mm diameter plastic pipe laid at the bottom of a trench. After the drain was installed, the trench was filled with gravel. Water flowing from land above the railway washed some of its gravel onto the railway, together with some larger pieces of rock which had formed part of the soil eroded from the sides of the trench. The leading power car continued most of the way over the bridge and fell from the railway down a wooded embankment, as did the third passenger carriage. The first passenger carriage came to rest on its roof, having rotated to be almost right angles to the track. The second passenger carriage also overturned onto its roof and came to a rest on the first carriage. The fourth passenger carriage remained upright and attached to the rear power car and also came to rest on the first carriage. All wheel sets of the rear power car derailed, but it remained upright. The RAIB investigation is ongoing. They will collect evidence needed to identify the factors relevant to the cause of the accident and its consequences. The scope of the RAIB investigation is likely to include the sequence of events and the actions of those involved, the operating procedures applied, the management of earthworks and drainage in the area, the general management of earthworks and drainage and associated procedures designed to manage the risk of extreme weather events, the behaviour of the train during and following the derailment, the consequences of the derailment and a review of the damage caused to the rolling stock, underlying management factors and the actions taken in response to the previous safety recommendations. So that's the end of Unit 4, Formation Engineering. Thanks for listening and bye for now.